The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Good evening, and welcome to Caltech and the Watson Lecture Series. I'm David Terrell, professor in the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Caltech and director of Caltech's Beckman Institute. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce my colleague Sarah Reisman, who will tell us about the role of organic chemistry in the creation of modern medicine. Sarah was born and raised in Bar Harbor, Maine, and introduced to chemistry at Connecticut College, where she developed her interest in the synthesis of new molecular structures. She then undertook graduate study at Yale University and postdoctoral work at Harvard before joining us at Caltech in 2008. In just six years, Sarah has established one of the nation's most important research programs in organic chemistry, recognized by major awards from the American Chemical Society, the American Cancer Society, and other organizations, and just two weeks ago by her promotion to the rank of full professor at Caltech. Sarah is also an outstanding teacher. Sarah is also an outstanding teacher who, in addition to teaching her own specialty in organic chemistry, has taken on the important task of teaching freshman chemistry to essentially every Caltech student through the core curriculum. Sarah's lecture tonight, the last in this year's Watson series, is entitled, From Nature to the Pharmacy, The Chemistry Behind Modern Medicines. Sarah Reisman. All right, well, thank you, uh, Dave, for that very nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to tell you about our um, research that we've been conducting in my lab over the last six years or so. And so I'm a synthetic organic chemist, and my group is interested in um, the synthesis of, of complex molecules that are known as natural products. These are molecules that are, are um, isolated from natural sources, and they've really served as, or played a foundational role in the, um, the modern pharmaceutical industry, right? So these are compounds that are biologically active and, um, and oftentimes can be either developed into medicines themselves or serve, serve as templates for uh, the development of, of new therapies. So what I'm gonna tell you today is about how we think about building molecules. How do we think about molecular structure and uh, why we're interested in natural products as sort of a starting point for our program, um, which is also very much interested in fundamental questions of chemical reactivity. So you're probably asking yourself right now, what is a natural product? This is a small organic molecule. It's isolated from, um, the, they're isolated from a variety of sources, from plants, from fungi, bacteria, or other microorganisms. And, and basically, this is nature's way of sort of playing chemical warfare, right? A lot of times, these compounds are developed for very specific purposes, and they endow a sort of protective um, feature to, to, the, to the producing organism. So compounds you might be familiar with, um, there's this molecule salicylic acid. It's a pretty simple compound. It's isolated from the bark of the willow tree. It has some analgesic properties, but actually where you might have seen it would be as an active ingredient in several over-the-counter um, uh, acne medications, right? So this is a small molecule. It comes from a natural source. As it turns out, um, uh, a compound that's actually consumed on the order of something like 40,000 tons per year um, is aspirin, right? So this is a simple modification. This is a semi-synthetic molecule. It has a simple modification from salicylic acid, um, but this modification means that this compound is gentler on the stomach than salicylic acid, and so we can take advantage of its analgesic properties. So this is an example of a natural product. Um, this is a relatively simple synthesis. Other compounds you might be familiar with, penicillin, right? This is an important antibiotic, also isolated in this case from a, 
um, from this uh, penicillium or several different um, strains of, of penicillium fungi. Um, and, and this is, was a critically important antibiotic when it was developed, right? It made a tremendous difference in uh, the number of casualties in World War II. Um, and it was really, I'd say, this molecule that sort of uh, taught us that we could take these compounds that are produced um, in nature and actually develop them as drugs, either as antibiotics or later as chemotherapies. Um, another important compound, maybe less people are familiar with it, but it has a pretty complicated structure. This is uh, generically known as paclitaxel. This is a molecule that's isolated from the Pacific yew tree, um, and it was initially developed by um, Bristol-Myers Squibb under the name of Taxol as a chemotherapy. Um, and this is actually still a, 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 a heavily prescribed chemotherapy to date. It's used to treat um, several cancers, including breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. Um, and, uh, and it was really this type of molecule that is isolated from a natural source that, that sort of drove um, uh, developments in synthetic chemistry and inspired several different um, uh, world-renowned synthetic groups to pursue natural product total synthesis. So several groups were interested in, in figuring out how to make this molecule from scratch, um, and, and, uh, and a number of groups have succeeded in that endeavor. The first uh, total synthesis or chemical synthesis of this molecule was reported by um, Robert Holton's group in 1994. So these are examples of natural products. You might know the names, but they're actually structures that are associated with these names, and it's these structures that are responsible for the function. And so in our lab, we like to think about these types of structures and think about how we might actually make them from scratch. How can we make them from chemicals you can buy at a supplier like Sigma Aldrich, um, and how can we actually do so in a way where we actually generate the same exact compound that you could isolate from the yew tree, but do so in the laboratory? So at this point, you might be asking, well, if these are all naturally occurring compounds, why do we need to make them in a laboratory? Why don't we just isolate them, right? So there are a number of different reasons why you might want to actually complete a chemical synthesis of a natural product and not just isolate it. And there, here are a few examples. So one reason would be that um, sometimes these drugs, they start out um, quite promising. So this is the structure of tetracycline. This was a uh, uh, essentially a wonder drug antibiotic when it was first developed. It was actually isolated by researchers at, at Pfizer back in the 1950s. Um, but pretty quickly we started to uh, develop resistant strains of bacterial infections and all of a sudden tetracycline is no longer um, as effective, right? And so by being able to complete a chemical synthesis of tetracycline, we can actually go ahead and make semi-synthetic derivatives or unnatural derivatives analogs of tetracycline. And so I've shown here this compound pig acyl. And so I'll talk in, in just a few minutes about what these structural representations mean, but I think you can even see here that if you remove these groups that I've highlighted in purple and then incorporate these groups that I've highlighted in blue, this is the transformation the chemists have achieved, and all of a sudden they have a, a drug that has broad spectrum activity um, against methicillin-resistant staph. So this is MRSA. So this is really important. If we know how to make these molecules, then we can improve upon um, their properties or we can access new drugs that maybe do things that the original natural product could not. Another reason that we are interested in the synthesis of these natural products is because oftentimes the natural source really can't um, sustain the burden uh, of producing enough compound uh, for commercialization. So this is a compound uh, called bryostatin. It's a pretty complicated structure here. Um, it was originally isolated from this coral-like bryozoan, um, and it has some very interesting properties. It's right now a clinical candidate for the treatment of uh, uh, several different types of leukemia and melanoma. Um, what's even more interesting is that scientists have found that if you administer this compound to rats within 24 hours of a stroke, you can actually um, help repair the brain tissue, so sort of recover some of the um, brain function that was lost as a result of that stroke. Um, the problem with this molecule is that it would require 14 tons of the bryozoa in order to produce the 18 grams of this molecule required to support a clinical trial. There's no way this is sustainable, right? There's, there's not going to be a drug developed from bryostatin if we have to harvest it from the natural source. And so by being able to build it up, 
from simpler commercially available starting materials, we can gain access to a compound with beneficial therapeutic properties without having to decimate um, this beautiful organism. So the third reason that I would give um, for why natural product synthesis is uh, an important endeavor is actually uh, is that it serves as a really nice inspiration for fundamental discoveries in chemical reactivity, right? It's the driving force um, for, the, for the discovery of new chemical reactions. So this is a reaction that we have discovered in our laboratory. It was very much inspired by our interest in the synthesis of a specific natural product, and I'll tell you a little bit about this story um, later on in, in the seminar. So, before I, I sort of get to this part of the talk, I thought what I would do is just give a little bit of a primer on some organic chemistry, what these representations of structures actually mean, um, and some interesting aspects of the three-dimensionality of these molecules, and then I'll tell you about the chemistry that we're working on. So let's return to penicillin. Um, this was a structure that I showed a few slides ago, um, and this is sort of how organic chemists draw penicillin. This is how we think about it. Um, if I was to actually uh, show you all of the atoms that are involved in penicillin and, and draw them out explicitly, it would look like this. And if you have any sort of aesthetic sensibilities, you might recognize that this is a pretty ugly rendering. It, it's crowded, um, but it does show all the carbon atoms, all of the carbon-hydrogen bonds, um, and so there's a little bit more information there. So really, with this type, type of structure, we're encoding more information than we're actually showing you. Um, and there are a few important things to know. So unless explicitly designated as another atom, for example, nitrogen or oxygen or sulfur, there's a carbon at each vertex, right? So uh, here is a carbon. You can see that if you look over at the other structure. Um, and more importantly, all uncharged carbons have four bonds to other atoms, right? So um, although I don't show it here, all you see are a bond um, uh, from this carbon over to the oxygen or to this other carbon. In reality, there are four bonds. It has a complete octet. Um, we follow uh, the rules that were laid out for chemical bonding established by Linus Pauling. Um, and, and so it's implicit that there are these carbon-hydrogen bonds here. We just leave them out so that our structures are not too overwhelming. We really just show the important functionality the, the parts of the molecule that remain are really the business end of the molecule. Those are what we call the functional groups. Those are the reactive groups that are responsible for engaging, let's say, in protein targets. So um, remember that uh, when, even though we don't show them, there are, there are, uh, there's structural information that's embedded here um, that's sort of implicit. Another important thing is that um, we try and, uh, although this is a, a two-dimensional representation, uh, we try and show that there is, that these molecules do exist in three dimensions. And the way we do that is to use these wedges. So this bond that I've highlighted here in, in purple, this is a wedge. That implies that that bond is coming out of the slide. And then we have these hashes. Um, as I've indicated in blue, that in indicates that the bond is going backwards back into the slide. Um, and so that gives us a way, uh, as chemists, of showing that, that these molecules really do um, have a three-dimensional structure associated with them. So to give you a sense of what I mean, here's a, a, a rendering of penicillin. The balls here, these um, represent various atoms. This is sulfur, red is oxygen, blue is nitrogen. Um, and what you can see is that there is, oops, I apologize here, there's a, a, a three-dimensional aspect to this structure, right? You can rotate around. You see that it take, there's a topography associated with this type of structure. And so when we think about how we make these molecules, we need to think about how do we connect the atoms, right? What carbon-carbon bonds do we build? Um, so the connectivity, but we also need to think about the spatial orientation of those atoms. Is that atom coming out of the board or going back into the board? So if we start talking about the three-dimensional shapes of these structures, what we really need to do is talk about one more topic in organic chemistry. Um, and this is something known as um, chirality. And so when we have three-dimensional structures, many of our, our natural products, in fact, any carbon that has four different things attached to it is known as a chiral carbon. And many of our natural products are made up of lots of different chiral carbons. And that imbues these structures with something known as chirality, right? So the definition here is that 
any object or system is chiral if it cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. Um, and these two mirror, uh, non-superimposable mirror images are a form of isomers. We call them enantiomers. And so if we have carbons with four different substituents, these are chiral carbons, um, and, and um, the molecules that contain these carb chiral carbons can exist as enantiomers. So I've shown two very simple molecules here. These two molecules are enantiomers. You can see that they're essentially identical, right? Each carbon has a chlorine, a bromine, a hydrogen, and a fluorine bound to it. And what you can see is that um, if you think about uh, the two molecules here, they reflect one another. There's a mirror plane that goes right through the middle of the screen, and we see a reflection. Um, I represented them here in their three-dimensional structures, and what you might recognize is that um, although these are reflections of one another, they are not superimposable. Try as you might to bring them together and superimpose all four of your atoms, it's just not going to be possible. If you line up the, the white and blue atoms, then your green atom and your red atoms will not be aligned. So these are non-superimposable mirror images. And probably the sort of most classic example of other things that um, are non-superimposable mirror images would be your hands. Right? We know that our hands are mirror images of one another. You can line them up so that there's a mirror plane. If you bring them together, you can align your fingers, but now your knuckles are, po are, are, are positioned on opposite sides, right? So your not knuckles are not perfectly aligned. Um, and so you can't get, you can show that they're mirror images of one another, but you cannot superimpose them. And in fact, this word chiral comes from the Greek word for hand. Right? And so it's referred to as handedness of these molecules. And it turns out that chirality is really important um, because although these molecules are essentially identical, the one thing that is different about them is how one chiral molecule will interact with another chiral molecule. And it turns out that most of our biological building blocks are chiral. So if you think about our amino acids, here are the 20 canonical amino, amino acids here. I've shown, um, it, for example, with asparagine, that you have four different substituents, four different groups are attached to the central carbon. This is a chiral molecule. And so if you take all of these chiral amino acids and you build them together, put them together in a, an oligomer um, to make a, a peptide or an even bigger peptide, a protein, there's going to be a chirality associated with that protein. And so that means that this protein is going to engage with a chiral small molecule in a very specific way, and that this protein can actually differentiate between two enantiomers of a small molecule. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. So our amino acids are chiral. That gives rise to chiral proteins. Our DNA, is our, our nucleotides are chiral. This gives rise to um, DNA with uh, a specific helicity, right? So we all know about the double helix. This has a right-handed um, twist to it, a right-handed helicity. Um, and, and this is a very specific spatial manifestation of these building blocks. Um, and that means that DNA can interact with chiral small molecules in a very specific way. So to give you an example of, of just how exquisitely selective these biological um, macromolecules are, I thought I would show a couple of examples. So for example, um, I've shown here two structures. These are mirror images of one another. They're non-superimposable, but otherwise they're identical, right? And on the left-hand side, we've, uh, uh, as chemists, we can sort of designate that the um, configuration here at the stereochemistry, we use S to sort of distinguish between these two, S or R. So on the left-hand side, we have what's known as S carbone. This is what's responsible for caraway flavor. So if you have rye bread, that distinctive flavor that, um, that you taste when you, when you, when you eat rye bread as a, as a result of your olfactory system distinguishing the two enantiomers of, of, S -car of carbone. And so the S carbone gives rise to the caraway flavor. The R car carbone, on the other hand, gives rise to spearmint flavor. Now, I personally don't care for rye bread or caraway, um, but I really like spearmint. And, and, and that's something that you know, I think is just amazing. These are essentially identical but my body can tell them apart. So similarly, um, and perhaps a little bit uh, more seriously, this is, uh, this is the origin of some of our um, uh, former problems with molecules like thalidomide, right? So R-thalidomide, shown here on the right side, this is a sedative. 
it was prescribed to women to relieve morning sickness. Um, and it, in fact, is the R enantiomer is very effective in that capability. The problem is that the S enantiomer um, can cause birth defects. And what the scientists who developed this drug didn't realize is that these two molecules can actually interconvert in the body. And so even though they thought they were administering arthrolidamide, it was turning into a mixture. And then we saw the result of that uh, with children being born with, with serious deformities and serious birth defects. So as you can imagine, if you can have these very dramatically different biological um, activities of these compounds, it becomes really important that we can make these molecules as single enantiomers, right? We need to make the right compound, and we want to do so with very high levels of selectivity. And in fact, now, if you want to get a drug through the FDA for good reason, they have very strict policies in terms of your characterization of the biological activity of both enantiomers, and you need to be able to establish that you're preparing just one and that it's stable under physiological conditions. So this is sort of just a setup for what my lab is interested in, right? We're interested in building molecules, um, and we like to think about building molecules um, as a single enantiomer, because if you really are interested in the function of those molecules, you really need to be able to access just one enantiomer of the compound. All right, so our scientific objective is to develop concise chemical syntheses of biologically active molecules, um, and this requires making new chemical bonds with precise positional and spatial control. And in order to achieve this objective, we, we seek to discover new chemical reactions. What we want to do is be able to make these molecules and do so in an efficient process. And oftentimes, that requires developing new tools in order to really build the types of bonds we need to build a molecule up from scratch. So the story I thought I would tell you about today is about a molecule called uh, nocardizine A. This is a natural product. It's produced by a marine bacteria known as um, nocardiopsis. And this uh, bacteria, bacterial strain was actually obtained from a sediment sample that was collected near um, Brisbane, Australia. So basically, they collected some marine sediment, cultured the bacteria, and they isolated this molecule. And they discovered that this compound is an inhibitor of a protein called, known as P-glycoprotein. So P-glycoprotein is basically a pump. It's what cells use to detoxify. Um, and so what you can imagine is that if you have a cell, a cancer cell, and you're administering chemotherapy and you're trying to kill this cell, it has a protective mechanism. It's going to upregulate P glycoprotein and try and pump this chemotherapy out of the cell so that you can't kill it. So over time, what often happens is as you treat this cancer cell with your chemotherapy, it develops a resistance. And that resistance is often associated with the upregulation of this protein. So you could imagine that if you have a molecule that's an inhibitor of P-glycoprotein, um, what you could do is administer it in combination with the chemotherapy, and you might be able to uh, restore the e efficacy of that type of drug, right? So if you have a, a cell line, it's developing resistance. All of a sudden, you administer it, co-administer it with an inhibitor of P-glycoprotein, and, and that chemotherapy, in principle, should begin to, um, to work better. So it was shown that nocardizine A actually increases the sensitivity um, to uh, uh, doxorubicin, a, a common chemotherapy in um, certain drug-resistant cancer cells. So it has some interesting function. Um, and it has an interesting structure, certainly a structure that challenges much of what we know in terms of uh, common synthetic methods, how you would put it together. So this is a, a, a molecule that we decided to target in our group. We thought to ourselves, how can we make this molecule from simple, commercially available uh, chemicals? So really, the challenge becomes, how do you reduce a compound that looks like this back to um, chemicals that can come in a bottle that you can buy from Sigma Aldrich? Um, and so what we want to do is prepare norcardiazine A from commercially available chemicals. Ideally, we want to use ex inexpensive reagents, um, robust chemistry, and we want to use as few chemical steps as possible, right? And so what we're going to do is start with something simple. We're going to elaborate atom by atom. And what we'd prefer to do is, is, is basically build up as many atoms per step as possible. So before we can talk about how we design a synthesis of, of nocardizine A, I think we need to talk more generally about how do synthetic chemists think about building a molecule. 
And we use a tool um, that we call retrosynthetic analysis. So we tend to start with the complicated target and work backwards. And so the idea is that you work backwards bit by bit, simplifying the molecule until you get to something that, um, is, that you can buy, that can come in a bottle. And so I like to think about this in the same way that you might deconstruct some sort of structure, right? In this case, it looks sort of like a house. I like to think of ourselves as molecular architects, so uh, that would be the analogy. Um, and so what we want to do is develop a synthetic plan, and we're going to do so by working backwards. So you can simplify this type of structure um, in this fashion. We're going to basically remove the door. That gives us these two shapes. You can simplify it further to the triangle and the rectangle. Now, this would be great as long as you can buy this triangle and this rectangle, but it might be that they're really expensive or they're not um, commercially available, and so you might have to make these structures as well, and so you could disconnect it further. So we could take this triangle back to two smaller triangles or the rectangle back to four building blocks, um, and that would be one synthesis, and that might work great, but perhaps, um, you know, all of a sudden the world supply of these rectangles is, is expired, and so we have to get creative and think about other synthetic routes. So maybe you could imagine putting this square together using these two triangles or the triangle together from these lines. And this is simply, this is the, the same idea of what we do when we work backwards from a complicated structure, a complicated molecule, we just simplify. We take off functional groups, we work back until we have things that are simple and abundant. So, if we think about it like that, really what I've shown here would be the equivalent of a blueprint. This is our synthetic plan. So we have to come up with a plan. Um, there's no one perfect plan. This is actually what I love most about what we do. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to put molecules together, and so you get to be creative. You get to think about uh, new chemistry that you might be able to use. So this is our blueprint. Um, if we think about these, uh, rep these sort of uh, shapes as representing molecules, um, these are gonna be our building supplies, and we're gonna put them together using chemical reactions. Um, and these chemical reactions are really gonna be the tools that we use. And sometimes we're gonna use tools that already exist. Um, maybe they've been around for five or 10, 20, 50 years. But sometimes we're gonna decide that the tools that exist already are just not good enough and we wanna develop new tools. We wanna to bring something new to the field. We wanna develop a new chemical reaction that we can use to bring the uh, molecules together. And actually, we always think of this as a really nice opportunity because it's when we develop new tools that we're really advancing the field of synthetic organic chemistry. So we can do a similar analysis of no Cardi's DNA. So I'll start here. This is our starting point. This is the structure. And here's the retrosynthetic analysis that my group came up with. So what we decided was to first uh, simplify just a functional group. Um, we're gonna remove this epoxide. These can be reactive. We wanna install it at the late stage of the synthesis. So we're gonna cut out this oxygen atom that I've highlighted here in red. We work backwards. This isn't that much simpler than no cardiazine A, but it's a good starting point. Then we decide, okay, how, how are we really gonna simplify this structure? What we decided to do was break this bond that I've highlighted here in red, and we can sort of flatten this molecule out, and now things are starting to look like structures that, that might be more accessible. You can simplify this further. In this case, we're gonna break through these bonds that I've highlighted here in red again. That takes us back to these two much smaller fragments. What's nice about this synthetic strategy is that in this stage, we've we've broken this molecule up into two molecules of comparable complexity. And so we can spend time making each of these and then we join them together and then we have a much more complex molecule. That, that strategically um, can be really advantageous. And then what we finally decided to do was break these two building blocks into smaller fragments um, by uh, deconstructing through the bonds that I've highlighted here in red. And that takes us back to molecules that we thought we could buy or we could make in one or two steps from commercial materials. So this was our retrosynthetic analysis. We're basically just working backwards. Now we do select the bonds we're gonna break based on sort of rules and guidelines that we've learned as organic chemists, precedent in the literature. Um, but, you know, there's nothing saying that, that this is the only way to make this molecule. There are actually a lot of different ways that you could imagine getting to this structure. There's also one other thing um, that's sort of problematic about this last disconnection that we propose, um, and that was that when we started this project, uh, this particular reaction did not exist. And so, 
you know, from the outset, we weren't going to be able to just build these two molecules um, using known chemistry. And this is where things get exciting. This is where we sit down and think about how we're going to take um, this proposal that we've drawn out on paper and reduce it to practice. How are we going to make this, turn this into a reaction that exists? Um, and, and just one other side note, I've sort of indicated here a couple of general groups. You can notice if you look at these two building blocks, although they're quite similar, they have different functionality here at the top and sort of hanging off this nitrogen. And so we wanted flexibility in our synthetic reaction. We wanted to be able to incorporate different X groups or different Y groups into our indole so that then we can get uh, to these types of fragments. So, so what we really need to do at this point is to develop a new chemical reaction. So this is the reaction we'd like to, 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 to um, achieve. Basically, we want to take this simple starting material. It turns out you can make this in one step from something you can buy from Aldrich. This is commercially available. This is a solvent. This is called dichloromethane. It's really just a medium by which you can add these two components together, have them interact, and hopefully go on to product. Now, the problem is that if you take these two components and you add them together, um, they don't give this product. You get none of this. Um, so this is not a spontaneous reaction. It doesn't happen under ambient temperature. You can't just um, generate this molecule. So we had to think a little bit about how we might engage these two components together. How could we convince them to form the carbon-carbon bonds or the, the two chemical bonds that we need to form in order to generate this product? And what we thought was that we might be able to um, promote this reaction. Oh, and, and so I, I guess if I was just to show why this reaction doesn't work um, schematically, um, basically what it means is that there is too high an activation energy to bring these two molecules, A and B, together to get to this product. So this is just not tenable under sort of standard conditions. But one of the ways that you might be able to accelerate this reaction, where you can actually lower the activation energy so all of a sudden it can happen at room temperature under standard conditions, would be to add a catalyst. So what we want to do is add a catalyst um, that's going to increase the rate of this reaction. What's nice about catalysts is that they're not changed or consumed over the course of the reaction. They're regenerated, at least until you get some sort of catalyst death. And so um, from a sustainability standpoint, Usually, catalytic reactions are actually preferable um, in terms of, of modern synthesis. So we want, want to identify a catalyst that will promote this reaction, but we actually want it to do one more thing. We don't want to just make the bonds. We want this catalyst to then control the three-dimensional shape of our structure. So what we want it to do, is, we, what we want to generate is a, or what we want to do is use a chiral catalyst that's going to promote this transformation to give the molecule where all of these bonds have wedges coming out of the screen. And we don't want it to generate any of the enantiomer, any of the molecule where all of these bonds have hashes going back into the screen. And so if we're going to be able to discriminate, if we're going to be able to make just one of these molecules and not the other, it's really imperative. Um, it's actually only possible when we use a chiral catalyst. So what we want the, chi the chiral catalyst to do is basically transfer its chiral information um, through the reaction to the product so that we're only generating single enantiomer of this species. So how do we think about chiral catalysts? How do we think about these types of transformations being possible? I actually think about it um, in an, using an analogy that's really um, quite uh, relevant to this time of year. If we think about commencement, you can think about a graduation ceremony as being a, a, the equivalent of a chemical reaction. You have some person, some student here who's really happy. They've just finished their four years, say, at Caltech. Um, and what the last thing that needs to happen is that they need to walk up on that stage and get the diploma in their hand. And so we can think about um, the president, who's sort of uh, overseeing the uh, commencement activities, as our catalyst. And, this pre and the president, so this is our new president at Caltech, um, Tom Rosenbaum, he's going to deliver the diploma to the student. And at the end of the day, we're still going to have an unchanged president, right? He's just going to take a diploma, hand it over to a student. He's a catalyst. And he's actually a very selective catalyst because of the handshake, right? So every time he takes his right hand and he shakes the right hand of the student, and in so doing, he engages through a very specific um, 
uh, uh, interaction with that student, right? Always the right hand, I except for at Caltech, sometimes maybe the left hand, but you know, most of the time the right hand. And then he's gonna deliver the diploma to the left hand. So every student is gonna have the diploma in their left hand. This is a selective reaction. And it's really the chirality is determined by this handshake, by this um, sort of this recognition, recognition element that we see here. And we can actually think about how effective, how efficient this chiral, the chiral catalyst is. We can do some math. So how efficient is the handshake? If 99 students get the diploma in their left hand, we only have one student who, for whatever reason, can't handle a handshake and ends up with the diploma in their right hand. Um, we can determine what we call an enantiomeric excess. So this is just the difference divided by the sum um, times 100. In this case, we're gonna get 98% uh, enantiomeric ex uh, excess. So we call this percent EE, we like high numbers. Uh, with chemical reactions, we like high numbers, we like high yields. With EEs, we like high numbers. Um, that indicates that we have a very selective reaction. So now we can go back and think about this um, in terms of the chemical reaction we want to develop. And, and our hypothesis is that we can take a chiral Lewis acid and that a chiral Lewis acid can catalyze the reaction between A and B and in so doing, it can also control the chirality of our product. Um, and so what we want is to form this molecule here and not this. And so if we draw schematically how we might envision a chiral catalyst engaging with our substrate, um, if you're in the absence of a, of a chiral catalyst, so let's just say we used a Lewis acid that we thought might promote this reaction, might act as a, as a catalyst, um, if, it, if it's not chiral, you can actually get approach of your molecules. You can get these carbon-carbon bond formations from either of two equivalent um, uh, trajectories, right? And so you're gonna get a racemic mixture. So if you have no chiral catalyst, you'll generate just as much of this molecule as you generate of this molecule. And that's not gonna be um, uh, very good at the end of the day if we wanna generate no cardiazine A in an antrian-rich form. And so we wanna use a chiral Lewis acid, and you can imagine this chiral Lewis acid doing a handshake with our substrate here, and perhaps it can engage with our substrate so that you have approach only from the top face. Um, this, uh, the bulk of the Lewis acid here gets in the way, so the molecule cannot approach from the bottom face. And so we're only gonna go through a specific type of uh, trajectory, and that could give rise to our natural product. So, so that's what we wanna do. We wanna identify a chiral Lewis acid. How do we actually do this experimentally in the lab? Well, we have a flask, we take our building blocks, um, add them to the flask, we screen a variety of different chiral Lewis acids, right? So uh, this is definitely a hypothesis-based process. We have ideas about the types of molecules um, that might work, but we can't predict um, a priori what the chiral Lewis acid is gonna be. Um, we're still a very empirical science, and so what we do is just screen basically every chiral Lewis acid we can get our hands on until we have a molecule that is produced in, in good enantio um, enrichment. So we put the chiral Lewis acid in, we let the reaction run at some temperature for some amount of time um, until we determine that all the starting material is consumed, and then we can use some techniques to isolate the product, to purify the product, to characterize the product, and, um, and ideally, what we've generated is, um, is this structure in good yield and with good enantiomeric excess. So uh, we use spectroscopic techniques to determine the identity of the, of the product. So this is an NMR. This allows us to assign the, the structure, as I've shown here. We can use um, uh, chromatographic techniques to determine the enantiomeric excess of this compound. So this is a, an HPLC trace where we've used a chiral stationary phase. We basically uh, have a, a technique where we can engage this molecule with a chiral um, uh, 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 spectrometer, essentially, um, and, and using that information, we can actually determine the enant enantiomeric excess of the product. So, um, so this is the process, and, and to be fair, for every uh, reaction that we develop in our lab, we go through an iterative cycle of setting a reaction up, analyzing the outcome hundreds of times. I mean, it's very empirical. We design lots of experiments. You do an experiment, you get information, you find out how good your catalyst is, 
You have an idea for how you can improve it, you run another experiment, and you repeat that cycle over and over again until you've identified a system that provides the desired results. And so you have to give a lot of credit to the people in the lab who are um, persistent and, and who will go through and, and systematically investigate these types of processes until we have the reaction we need. So after running what's probably hundreds of reactions, what we initially identified um, or ultimately identified is that we can promote this reaction. Actually, I say that this is a chiral Lewis acid. It turns out that's what we had initially expected, um, but we've learned more about the mechanism and it's much more complicated uh, than this. Um, but that's okay, that's actually interesting. That, that leads to some more discoveries beyond what I'm gonna talk about today. But ultimately what we found is that we could add a catalyst to the flask, we can isolate the product um, in good yield and in high enantiomeric excess. So this means that for say every 100 molecules, 95.5 of them have the desired configuration and then 4.5, you can't have half a molecule but you get the point, um, has the undesired um, configuration. So, so this was exciting because because um, now we have a tool that we can use, right? We actually found that you can vary the substrate so we can put different groups out here on the starting material and it still works. So this is just a few examples. The yields are somewhat variable but the selectivity is pretty good in all cases. And so now we can think about how can we use this reaction to build a molecule like no cardazine A. So we can go back to our retrosynthetic analysis that I've shown here. Um, so this is where we started. Um, and so now, instead of saying that this reaction doesn't exist, now we know that this reaction does exist. We have this tool. We can think about how we can elaborate forward. Um, it turns out that in this synthetic endeavor, once we spent all the time developing this reaction, it was this last reaction that didn't work. So that's a little frustrating, but that also happens all the time in organic chemistry. It's never the experiment that you think is gonna be challenging um, that ends up uh, posing sort of the biggest uh, challenge in terms of completing a synthesis. And we spent a lot of time thinking about why this didn't work, um, and that would be a story for another day as well. Um, but ultimately, what, what we did was we just came up with a new synthetic plan, right? As I said, there's no one perfect way to make a molecule. We thought this was gonna be a pretty good way. It turns out it wasn't. So what do we do? We revise our synthetic plan. We break different bonds this time. So now we're gonna sort of change the order of events. We're gonna break the bonds that I've shown here in red, um, takes it back to this type of structure. We went ahead and put that uh, functional group that we couldn't install at the end. We installed it early because we we're like, we're gonna have that there um, early on before we get all the way to the end again. And so we can simplify um, through this bond. We're gonna break here. That takes us back to these same building blocks. We already know how to make these building blocks using the reaction we've developed. And so I'll just take you through the synthesis in the forward sense. Um, there's gonna be a lot of chemical reagents. Don't worry about that. What I wanna show you is how we can elaborate from things that are simple to something that's much more complex. So uh, in order to, to make no cardiazine A, we actually start with these two starting materials here. And this is the reaction we developed. I didn't show the full structure of the catalyst. Um, in fact, we use slightly different catalysts for both of these transformations, but we can access these building blocks um, in pretty good enantioselectivities. The yields are a little lower than we'd like. It turns out that these are both challenging substrates um, for this chemistry. They taught us a little bit about the reaction. We'd like to improve upon that, but actually this is why it's good that we actually have to test our method. It, it shows us some of the limitations and points us where we're gonna move um, going forward. So we have these building blocks and, and what you might see is that the structure that's embedded here is found um, twice in no cardiazine A. We have it on the left-hand side we have it on the right-hand side. So now we've been able to build the left-hand part of the molecule and the right-hand part of the molecule, and we need to bring them together so that we get to the natural product. Um, to do that, I'm not gonna take you through this chemistry. We can, do, we can convert this molecule to this other molecule in four chemical reactions. So I'm just gonna uh, point out what we change. We remove this group down here and turn it into a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. And then we change the stereochemistry at this position and remove this group. So that gives us this building block. Um, and then we can sort of move through the synthesis. We start with our other building block, we elaborate it, we add this functionality here that I've highlighted in purple. We do another reaction that puts in um, this group known as an epoxide. 
We do another reaction that activates this group so that now we can bring our two fragments together. Now we can uh, join the two groups. So now we've incorporated this entire complex right-hand part of the molecule. And then we can cyclize. And so using this last set of conditions, we can access the natural product. And so we're here in 10 steps if you just count the longest linear sequence of reactions. And that's pretty good, actually, for a molecule of this complexity. Um, that's sort of 10 steps. That means that um, in the end, if we needed to make a lot of this molecule, we probably could. We need to work on those first two reactions, but uh, we're in pretty good shape here. And so now that we have access to this um, molecule, we have uh, submitted it to a collaborator down at UCSD. So uh, Jeff Chang is actually the world's expert in p-glycoprotein. And what we hope to do is learn how this molecule engages with the protein so we might be able to um, develop even more effective compounds or even just shed some light on how these types of structures um, operate. We've also sent some of our, our building blocks, some of these new uh, molecules that had never been made before, We've sent them to a collaborator to see if any of them are actually used by the organism as biosynthetic intermediates. So by uh, having synthetic access to these compounds, we can actually perhaps learn a little bit about how uh, the bacteria makes no cardiazine um, through uh, 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 biosynthetic studies. So, um, so this, is, this is exciting. We've done the chemistry part, and now we have access to this compound, and we can think about the biology. So just to sort of wrap up um, my presentation, you know, I think natural product synthesis is a fantastic uh, arena for us to think about uh, developing new chemistry, for learning more about chemical reactivity. And at the end of the day, it also provides access to a compound that has interesting function. And so then we can study more about the biology. And it was really this natural product synthesis interest that gave rise um, to the discovery of a new chemical reaction. And now that we have this synthetic tool, we can actually think about applying it in other contexts. So you might be able to then go ahead and use this chemistry to make other natural products. I've shown just three of them here. They all have what's known as this indoline core that I've highlighted in blue, the same as what we generate in this reaction. So we spent a little bit of time, we invested time in developing new chemistry, but hopefully, if we wanted to, we could then use it um, to make uh, these molecules, or perhaps in trying to make these molecules, we might learn about the shortcomings of this chemistry and develop other synthetic methods. So that's what we do in our lab. We think about how do we build molecules? Can we develop new chemistry, new tools to build these molecules? And then once we have those molecules in hand, can we engage with collaborators to understand their, their biological function? And really, that last part is um, all a result of the fact that these are, are natural products. These are molecules that have been made to do something in nature, and now we can generate them in the laboratory. So with that, um, I'll thank my group. Uh, I have a terrific group of colleagues here at Caltech. Um, these are, this is my current lab. I've already graduated um, several um, uh, PhD students. Uh, I've also worked with several um, collaborator uh, with several postdocs, excuse me. Um, the chemistry that I talked about today was done by just a few people. So uh, Lindsay Repka, one of my first graduate students, really started um, this project. It was also um, carried out, uh, taken over by Jay Ni and Hao Xuan. Um, they are both here in the audience today, I see. Um, and we've actually had a lot of other people come in and, and contribute in various aspects um, uh, uh, to this chemistry. Uh, we have been very fortunate to uh, be supported in this project by the National Institutes of Health, uh, as well as the American Cancer Society. Um, we also have uh, received um, unrestricted grants from several other organizations um, that have given us a lot of freedom to pursue a lot of different chemistry um, in the lab. And so this is a picture of our, of our group from this February. Um, uh, they're really, this is the important part of the acknowledgement slides. They're just a terrific group of, co of co-workers. Um, and uh, I feel really fortunate to be here at Caltech where I get to work with very talented students. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, you know, hopefully you learned a little bit about organic chemistry and why it's really important. Um, and it really serves as the underpinnings um, for how we make molecules. And, uh, and, and that's a very important endeavor for, um, for modern medicine and, and, and uh, drug discovery. So thank you.